Lecture six of the World of Sound by Sir William Bragg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sound in War. It is ages and ages ago since animals left the water for the land and developed the present ear with its marvellous powers of detecting sound. And now, after all this time, we have some of us to fight once more a great enemy lurking in the sea and once more it is the question how best to be aware of him how shall we detect the submarine can we again use pressure waves or shall we be able now to use sound vibrations or is there any new method which we can devise most of the methods which first suggest themselves fail completely in one way or another it has often been proposed that powerful underwater lamps should be employed to light up the sea and make the submarine visible nowadays we can make very powerful lamps indeed but unfortunately light cannot be made to penetrate sea water to any great extent the water is so full of matter in suspension that light rays are scattered in all directions as they try to go through it the same problem confronts the motor driver in a fog when he gains nothing by lighting the powerful headlights of the car all he does is to light up the particles of the fog in front of him and to dazzle his eye so that he finds greater difficulty in seeing ahead of him than if he had left the lights unlit it is to be remembered that whether an object is distinctly seen or not depends much more on contrast with the background than on the actual amount of light thrown on the object itself the eye has the power of adjusting its sensitivity over an extraordinarily wide range in the daytime the light of a candle seems nothing at night in a room where there is no other light it seems dazzling some friends of mine once measured as it is possible to do the actual illumination of a piece of white paper beside an artist who was sketching out of doors they were curious to observe how the illumination would change as the evening wore on there came a time when the artist said he must stop as the light was going and he could not see to paint any more the light was then found to be nearly ten thousand times less than when they made their first measurement it is no use therefore to send great beams of light into the sea in the hopes of lighting up what may be there and the most powerful light is little better than any other the full range of visibility in the clear sea water of the west indies or the mediterranean is one or two hundred feet in the muddy water of the north sea the range is often no more than a few feet next we have electricity and magnetism at our disposal but we can make very little use of them for detecting a submarine at any distance the reason is simple all electric and magnetic effects fall off very rapidly as the distance from their source is increased at a few hundred feet away from a submarine neither its magnetism nor any other electric or magnetic quality which it possesses can produce an effect which can be detected among the crowd of other like though small effects which are always present our modern instruments are fine enough to detect exceedingly minute disturbances but again it is a question of background if a delicate instrument could be mounted on an extremely quiet concrete foundation and if there were no other electric or magnetic disturbances it might be possible to detect the submarine at say half a mile or so but then it is hopeless to ask for such conditions unless we can detect at a mile or so with fair certainty we are practically helpless for reasons easy to understand if ships are chasing submarines they will never find them in the wide seas unless they know when they are within a mile of them at least the position would be like that of a very short-sighted golfer who had not seen which way his ball went the ball being probably able to see him and in any case anxious and able to keep out of his road if on the other hand a ship is being stalked by a submarine 
the ship is in the gravest danger unless the presence of the enemy can be observed while he is yet a mile away judged by the mile standard electricity and magnetism fail entirely we must therefore fall back on sound on listening to vibrations in the water which are due to the presence of the enemy which vibrations we are to detect by suitable means sound can at least under certain circumstances be heard at a distance of more than a mile our ears are far more efficient and highly trained than the primitive hearing organs of the fishes and moreover a submarine cannot move as noiselessly as a fish both these things are to the good but there are many other things to consider we are no longer able to use our ears under water in any way useful to our present purpose we are obliged to use some mechanical means some intermediate agent to bring the sound out of the water and to deliver it to the ear and here lies one of our greatest difficulties the fact that we can never transfer the sound without distorting it more or less the great delicacy of the ear is accompanied by a certain disadvantage in that having become highly trained in the perception of delicate shadings and gradations of sound it is all the more easily upset when the sounds have been juggled with there is one very simple way of transferring the sound which can readily be tried it was used long ago by Colodon when he measured the velocity of sound on the lake of geneva it is enough to lower into the water a hollow body such as a tin can or a rubber ball or even a piece of rubber tube plugged at one end and connect the air inside with the ear by a sufficient length of tubing or pipe a stethoscope makes a convenient finish but is not absolutely necessary sound pulses under water press on the submerged cavity sending pulses up the air of the tube into the ear with this you may listen to the ticking of a watch contained in a tin floating in a tank as shown in the figure this simple contrivance does not distort the sound much when the cavity has rubber walls if one of the walls is made of thin metal plate the instrument is far noisier and there is considerable distortion or alteration of the sound figure seventy nine on the left vessel with thin metal wall on the right closed rubber tube the wall has vibrations of its own which are excited whenever it is struck a perfectly steady sound does not excite them but a sudden impulse calls them forth they are strong at the moment when the first stroke of a submarine bell reaches the plate and their importance dies down during the following ring every change in a sound counts as a blow and of course there are continual changes during any series of sounds such as we want to listen to under water consequently the original sound is overlaid by the jangling sound of the wall and much of the finer analyzing power of the ear is wasted the same sort of effect occurs when we use a telephone or when a gramophone record is made or used there are always some parts of the instrument such as the mica disc or the walls of the horn or air cavities which have notes of their own and spoil the true rendering of the sound and from what we have already seen we know that faithfulness is far more important than mere volume of sound it is always noticeable that those who have to use listening instruments prefer such as are less intense if only they are more faithful it is the beginner who likes something that is loud the unfaithfulness is much increased if there is any action of resonance this is an effect which we will illustrate by means of two tuning forks which are exactly alike i sound a strongly and stop it with my hand almost at once i then find that b is sounding although i have not touched it i take my hand away from a and after a few seconds put it on b so as to stop b's vibrations i then find that a is sounding again 
thus the sound has been handed backwards and forwards but if b is not of the same pitch as a the effect does not occur if therefore there is a steady note in the sound to be listened to which corresponds to some note belonging to the instrument itself this note is unduly emphasized and for this reason also the sound is distorted sometimes electrical means are used to transfer the sound from the receiver to the ear it is not always convenient or even possible to connect the listening instrument to the ear by means of an air channel as in figure seventy eight the tube would be too long and cumbersome an electric system is much more flexible in such cases a microphone is attached to the inside of the receiving plate as in figure eighty and the sound is transferred by electric current in the ordinary way in fact the receiving instrument is now nothing else than a telephone which can be used under water the instrument is sometimes put into a tank full of water one side of the tank being part of one side of the ship the bell's sounds come through the ship's side into the water of the tank and excite vibrations in the metal plate these are transmitted in electrical form by means of the microphone and the electrical equipment to the listener's cabin the apparatus though more convenient is more complicated than the simple arrangement described above and every addition brings in fresh opportunities for unfaithfulness of rendering an instrument of this construction was made in great numbers during the war and issued to the small vessels mostly drifters which guarded the coasts it is shown in figure eighty figure eighty receiving instrument used by the drifters that patrolled the coast during the war the instrument was lowered overboard at the end of the cable that carried the wires communicating with the microphone it is curious to observe the change in a sound record when a difficulty of this kind is removed the two lines in figure eighty one are sound records made visible the electrical currents which pass through the microphone are made to move a very light mirror which throws a spot of light on a moving kinematograph film so making the photographic record of the figure two underwater instruments are recording the sound made by a passing vessel though not exactly at the same moment the upper record comes from a microphone mounted on a small metal plate as in figure eighty the lower from a microphone mounted inside a block of rubber in the latter case there is no metal sheet to have vibrations of its own the rubber is free from them we see the corresponding difference in the shape of the records in particular there is between a and b in the top record a series of regular vibrations which is really due to the instrument and forms no part of the original sound we do not find any such series in the lower record figure eighty one the upper figure shows the kind of record that is made by a microphone mounted on a metal plate as in figure eighty the lower the record when the microphone is mounted inside a rubber block suppose that we have overcome as satisfactorily as may be the difficulty of transferring the sound from the water to the ear without distortion we have still a difficulty to face greater even than the first if we take one of the instruments we have devised and try to use it on board ship we find that the water round the ship is often full of noise which may drown the sounds we want to hear there is of course no disturbing noise round a stationary ship in a smooth sea supposing that no engines are working on board but if the sea is rough there is a noise due to the crashing of the water against the ship's sides if the ship is under way there is a noise due to the movement through the water in some cases particularly to the movement of the instrument through the water and if the ship is driven by engines there is a great volume of noise due to the screw and the engines main and auxiliary under such conditions it is as difficult to hear a submarine as it would be for the occupant of a motor-car to hear a sparrow moving in a hedge as he went by 
and in war it is generally too dangerous to stop for the purpose of listening finally the modern submarine can go very quietly if it does not go too fast most of the noise of a moving ship comes from the screw as it revolves it leaves holes in the water just behind its blades cavitations as they are called when the walls of the cavitations collapse together noise is started and the accumulation of sounds of this kind is mainly what we hear in the listening instruments through it all we hear the beat of the engines or the whir of the turbines or other special noises largely through the agency of the cavitations if the screw goes slow the cavitations are not formed and there is very little noise a submarine need not hurry if its presence is unknown footnote gramophone records of the noises due to moving vessels and submarines were used at the lecture End footnote. we see therefore that the transference of sound from the sea to the ear is a matter of many difficulties in practice it is found that ways of avoiding them can be devised which will be effective under suitable conditions but i may not follow the subject further in this direction we must not try to consider what further developments may be in the purposes of the admiralty there is a different aspect of the problem which has points of great interest if by listening an observer can be sure that a submarine is in the neighbourhood it does not help him much unless he can find in what direction it lies from his own vessel it is necessary to devise an instrument which will indicate the direction from which a sound is coming one method is based on a principle described by the late lord rayleigh and others suppose that a flat plate is vibrating and giving off sound pulses into the air it is found that little or no sound travels away in the plane of the plate it is all to be found on one side or the other the converse is true when a plate is placed edgeways on to a distant sound the sound waves pass by on either side of the plate and their actions on the plate balance so that it does not move here for instance is a sheet of mica mounted on a ring at the centre of the sheet is a microphone from which wires are led to a loud-speaking telephone set in the usual way when i sound a tuning fork and hold it on one side of the mica we can all hear the sound in the telephone but when i move the fork so that it is in the plane of the mica we hear it no longer the mica has ceased to vibrate in response to the fork because the sound waves now sweep by on either side and their pressures on the mica balance each other figure eighty two when the tuning fork is held symmetrically at the edge of the disc very little sound comes from the megaphone but when it is held to one side the response is loud in this experiment i am obliged to use a loud speaking telephone and to put the tuning fork very close to the sheet so that the effect is great enough for all to hear were we content to hear one at a time and use ordinary telephones we could put the source of sound a long way away an experiment with a model will make this principle clearer a short pendulum is suspended over a tank in which is a shallow layer of water the bottom of the pendulum has a paddle which dips into the water the pendulum is now arranged so that it can swing along the tank and the paddle is across it i start a wave at one end of the tank which runs slowly along it when the wave reaches the paddle the pendulum swings but now i turn the pendulum round through a right angle so that it can only swing across the tank and the paddle points along it when a wave reaches it the pendulum does not now swing at all just so when a plate on which a microphone is mounted is held edgeways to a source of sound it hears nothing the noise is heard as soon as the plate is turned so as to present one face to the source an instrument made up in this way for use at sea is shown in the figure a heavy ring serves as a mounting for a sheet of metal carrying at the centre a small watertight box which contains a microphone 
this is lowered into the sea at the end of a long tube which serves also to carry the electrical connections when in use the instrument is rotated and the position in which the instrument does not hear gives the direction from which the sound is coming there is however no means of deciding which of the two directions in the plane of the instrument is the right one a very curious discovery was made in one of the admiralty laboratories which removed this difficulty it was found that the instrument could be made deaf on one side by placing near it on that side a block of some material which must be non-resonant that is to say must give a dull sound when struck and which must contain an air cavity of a certain size moreover the block must be placed at just the right distance from the microphone with this addition to the instrument there is no longer any doubt as to which of the two opposite directions is the right one the instrument hears best when the sound comes in on the side away from the block it hears very little if the other face or either of the edges is presented to the sound figure eighty four the directional hydrophone the one without the so-called baffle cannot decide between the two opposite directions in its own plane the baffle removes the ambiguity another way of determining direction is based on the binaural principle we have already considered imagine two ordinary hydrophones such as in figure eighty or the simple non-electrical receivers of figure seventy nine to be lowered into the sea and each to be connected to one ear if our ears were where the hydrophones are and could be used in that position we should be able to judge direction just as we do in the air if the hydrophones rendered to the ears the sounds as received by them it would be possible to find the direction of the sound by moving the hydrophones until the sound seemed to be equally heard in each ear there would still be a doubt as to whether the sound was in front or behind the imaginary head in the water but the doubt could be removed at once by turning the pair of hydrophones a little one way or the other and observing which ear now seemed to have the sound in practice it is found that the electrical hydrophones so distort the sounds that the ears cannot find direction satisfactorily but the simple receivers of figure seventy nine when made of rubber work very well the binaural principle was put to most excellent use by the miners of the allied armies when our men were tunnelling towards the enemy lines they could often overhear noises made by the picks or other tools of the enemy or by their movements it was then very necessary to find the direction from which the sound came for this purpose a pair of instruments as shown in figure eighty six was used figure eighty six a tunneler finding the direction of the enemy's mining operations by the use of two geophones one connected to each ear the details of a geophone are shown in the drawings on the right of the figure inside a wooden box about three inches across and two deep are two mica discs which hold a heavy mass of mercury between them above and below the discs are empty spaces which can be connected to the ears by tubes when simple listening was required without any attempt to find the direction from which the sound was coming a geophone was laid on the ground and the two air spaces were connected to the two ears one to each any sound pulses that came through the earth shook the geophone but the heavy mercury stayed still while the box moved relatively to the mercury consequently the air spaces above and below the mercury were alternately compressed and expanded and pulses ran up the tubes to the ears movements of the enemy might be heard at twenty or fifty or a hundred feet according to the conditions two geophones were used when direction was required one tube in each geophone was closed by a cork and the other connected to one of the observer's ears as shown in the figure unless the line joining the geophones was at right angles to the direction from which the sound was coming the pulses would reach one geophone before the other 
and it would seem to the observer that the sound was in the ear connected to that geophone. He could turn the geophones to new positions on the floor until the sound was equally heard in the two ears. He would then know the direction of the enemy. In this case there would be no doubt, as there was in the corresponding case at sea, because the enemy was certainly in front. If the geophones were then used to find the direction at another place, the two directions could be marked on the map and the actual position of the enemy workers could be found. If the geophones were placed against a wall above each other, it was possible to get the up and down direction, which would also, of course, be required. Footnote. See Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, H.S. Ball, 10th of April, 1919. The paper from which this description of geophones is taken gives an account of an operation which illustrates their use very well. On a certain occasion, a tunnel had to be driven forward in order to get under and blow up some enemy wire. When the work was nearly done, it was found that the enemy, who had been heard at intervals, were only six feet away, and their laughing and talking could be plainly heard. It was of the greatest importance to know whether they were going to break through, for this would bring the British operations to a premature end and spoil the plans that had been made. However, it was found, by a comparison of all the geophone records that had been made, that the enemy gallery, though close to our own, was being driven parallel to it, and a breakthrough was not likely to occur. Accordingly, the British work was not interrupted, and was finally brought to a successful conclusion. We now come to one of the most important uses of sound in the war, the location of enemy guns. Our French allies made the first attempts to apply sound to this purpose. Our own work began a year later than theirs. The shell from a modern high-velocity gun makes a sound as it passes like the crack of an explosion. The position of the gun can be calculated either from observations on the sound of the shell or on the sound of the firing of the gun itself. The first method was used during the early part of the war, but the second was finally adopted by our own armies. There are points of great interest in both methods. Let us first consider the sound made by the shell. When a boat or a swimming animal moves sufficiently fast over the surface of a still lake, we see a V-shaped boundary to the ripples that spread away on either side, as is shown in the drawing. The effect does not appear unless the object is moving faster than the waves which it sets up, so that it is always, so to speak, on the top of these waves. Exactly the same thing occurs in the air when a bullet or a shell is moving faster than the velocity of sound, which is, with modern guns, a very common occurrence. When this happens, there is the same V-shaped wave, but now it is in the air. The effect is most beautifully shown in photographs taken some years ago by C. V. Boys. Here is the picture of a bullet from a Martini Henry rifle, figure 87, travelling faster than sound, and yet seemingly at rest, because the electric spark which cast a shadow of the bullet on the photographic plate lasted but a minute fraction of a second. Figure 87 Bullet from Martini Henry Rifle, photographed while in flight by C. V. Boys. Two V-shaped ripples are clearly seen, one coming from the nose and one from the stern of the bullet. The V-shaped wave is highly compressed and has refracted the waves of light in much the same way as happens when you look over the top of a fire burning in the open and see the objects beyond quivering in the heat. In this case, however, it is the mingling of hot and cold air which bends the rays of light, whereas in the former case it is rather the compression of the air in the wave. Besides the V-shaped wave from the front of the bullet, there is also a V-wave from the back of it, and it is worthwhile too to notice the turbulent backwater behind it, which effect we have seen before. 
another interesting thing in the picture is the reflection of part of a v-wave by a screen at the side when the v-shaped wave made in this way by a high velocity shell passes over an observer he hears a sound like an explosion of a gun because the wave contains highly compressed air the change from the pressure of the ordinary air beside the observer's head to the pressure when the wave is going over it is very sudden and has a violent action on the ear an explosive wave of this kind an onde du choc as the french call it is caused whenever an object moves faster than sound the tips of an aeroplane propeller may exceed this speed and a listener close to them then hears a succession of explosive sounds like the cracks of a pistol the crack of a whip is no doubt due to the same cause a wave runs down the cord and carries energy to the lash at the end which is so light that it is set into most violent motion in a paper published by the royal society in 1908 Mr. Malloch describes experiments he made on the sound of the onde du choc on a rifle range. He found that an observer could always tell the direction from which the sound seemed to come. It was clearly a case of binaural hearing, the wave reaching one ear before the other. He drew a plan of the range and of the direction of the sound as it seemed to several observers of course none of these directions pointed to the position of the gun each observation showed the direction in which the onde du choc was travelling as a bullet or shell slows down the v becomes more and more blunt in front the directions found by the observers in mallock's experiment are less and less inclined to the direction in which the bullet is moving figure eighty eight diagram from mallock's paper Proceedings of the Royal Society, 1908, page 115. A bullet is fired from firing point to target 1,000 yards away. The onde du choc passes over the heads of the observers, whose positions are denoted by small circles. Each records the direction from which the sound seemed, as shown by the arrows on the diagram, to come in each case the direction is perpendicular to the onde du choc as it goes by the observer it is actually possible to calculate the position of the gun from observations of this kind though the figures used in the calculation differ for each type of gun and it is therefore necessary to know what gun is firing the method much elaborated was used during the war in spite of these difficulties the simple and highly efficient method finally adopted by the british army was based on observations of the sound of the explosion due to the gun itself figure eighty nine the diagram illustrates the sound ranging principle suppose that a gun fires and that observers with microphones placed at three points a b and c register and compare the times at which the sound wave reaches the microphones draw round b a circle having a radius equal to the distance sound will travel in a time equal to the difference between the a and the b observations of the arrival of the sound draw round c a circle with a radius equal to the time that sound would travel in a time equal to the difference between the a and c observations then draw a circle to go through a and to touch the circles drawn round b and c the centre of this circle must be the position of the gun in practice there were six microphones the greater number being adopted in order to give greater accuracy and to allow for one or more being out of order wires from all of them were led to a central station where each was joined up to its own recorder each recorder operated by throwing a fine point upon a kinematograph film figure ninety shows the arrangement of a sound ranging station at the top of the diagram is the area occupied by enemy batteries just beneath that is the front line at the base of the diagram is the central station dugout 
and leading from there are lines leading to six microphone bases halfway between the central station and the front line there are also lines leading to two advanced posts much closer to the front line End reader's note. when no disturbance came in from any microphone six straight lines were drawn side by side on the film but if the explosion wave of the gun reached a microphone the corresponding line was broken in figure ninety one the record of an enemy howitzer is shown we observe the successive breaks as the wave reaches the microphones in turn very great accuracy was required in the observations of the time the film moved rapidly as we can see by the time scale shown in the figure in fact observation could be made to two or three thousandths of a second figure ninety one a piece of kinematograph film showing the effect of a fifteen centimetre german howitzer the horizontal lines are the records made by the recorders and are unbroken straight lines until the gun wave arrives the vertical lines show the time there being one hundred to the second by courtesy of nature the six microphones were spaced along a base about nine thousand yards long and four thousand yards behind the front line the central station was placed in a cellar or dugout some five thousand or six thousand yards from the front line in front of the base were the advanced posts at each of which an observer was stationed when he heard a hostile gun fired and considered that its record was wanted he pressed a key which set all the apparatus going at the central station when the microphones had all registered on the film the latter was developed fixed measured and read and in a very few minutes a telephone message would be on its way to our own batteries giving them the enemy position the average error at a range of ten thousand yards was about fifty yards the sound rangers could work in foggy weather or in any weather except when westerly winds blowing towards the guns lifted the sound waves over their heads and left them nothing to observe they were responsible for a great proportion of all the locations of guns on the front photographic observations from aeroplanes were responsible for another the two methods playing into each other's hands the reason why sound goes up in the air when it moves against the wind is easily understood from figure ninety two figure ninety two showing why sound which travels against the wind rises from the ground and goes over an observer's head sound waves start from a source s but the wind is travelling slower near the ground than higher up because it is retarded by the obstructions it meets on the earth's surface the top parts of the waves are therefore bent back as the figure shows and the whole series of waves moving forward at right angles to itself mounts into the air the observer is quite out of their track it was often observed during the war that though this might be the case close up to the front yet the sound of the guns could be clearly heard farther back in england for example it is easy to see how this might happen though the explanation in each separate case might not be exactly the same if there is a westerly wind below and an easterly wind above the sound waves are thrown back at first and mount upwards in the way explained already but when they reach the upper current which is blowing the opposite way the waves are again swung round and come down again the sound ranging apparatus used by the army during the war has been applied by the navy to a very important problem that of finding the position of an explosion at sea in this case the hydrophones described already are used as the listening microphones they are placed in carefully surveyed positions a few miles out from the shore and are arranged over a base about fifteen miles long they are all connected by submarine cables to a central station on shore where the instruments and the arrangements are the same as those of the army except that everything is out of range of gunfire and is therefore more comfortable and convenient 
the microphone responds readily to the wave caused by a distant explosion that is because the little grains of carbon in the microphone are disarranged by the slightest tap especially if it is sharp like the click when one hard surface hits another now the explosion wave is exactly of that character the narrowness of the v-shaped wave in the photographs taken by boys shows how suddenly it must be felt when it passes by the water carries a sharp wave of this kind very well consequently an explosion can be registered at an immense distance how far has never yet been properly determined the design of the microphone and its electrical equipment are still under investigation figure ninety three naval sound ranging by hydrophones an actual record of an explosion at sea is seventy miles away the time scale is the same as in figure ninety one some experiments carried out at culver in the isle of wight showed that depth charges dropped overboard by a destroyer near the french coast gave excellent records in later work explosions have been detected hundreds of miles away a sound ranging station for underwater determinations may be used to give the position of any explosion within forty or fifty miles a combination of two stations a hundred miles apart can give a position to about half a mile at two hundred miles range the system though developed for purposes of war has given some of its best results in time of peace for it has been found most useful in charting the seas imagine a surveying ship far from the land in the north sea without landmarks without even a clear sky a wreck or the edge of a minefield or a sandbank has to be marked on the chart as found a charge is dropped and explodes the explosion travels away until it reaches the hydrophones on the english coast the records are developed and read and in a very few minutes the exact position is marked on the map and if required a wireless message sent out to the ship possibly the method will also find a use in giving positions to ships which are making the coast and are lost in a fog or an aeroplane may send ashore a message which is automatically dated and placed finally we must also consider for a moment the use of sound in connection with war in the air it is obvious of course that there are ways of finding from what direction the sound of an aeroplane has come we might for example make use of the power of a concave mirror to focus a sound as we saw in one of our first experiments the hum of an aeroplane is low in pitch the sound waves are long and therefore the mirror must be correspondingly large that is not very convenient but it is not necessary that the mirror should be easily or quickly moved during the listening if the mirror is stationary the focus moves and its position at any moment can be found by searching for it with some convenient form of listening apparatus the direction of the sound can then be found by a simple calculation sound ranging methods cannot be used since they register the time of arrival of an explosion wave that is to say of one sharply defined pulse but in this case as in listening for submarines we have to find the direction from which a more or less continuous sound is coming perhaps the binaural sense supplies the simplest method of finding direction it can be sharpened by suitable means for example by the use of listening horns leading to the ear and it is really very accurate there is one obvious difficulty the sound of a distant aeroplane takes several seconds to reach the observer and the aeroplane has moved on some distance before the sound gets to him the track can be plotted but can never be brought quite up to date here we must stop sound you will see has played a great part during the war in the air on land underground and at sea in every branch of warfare it is also true and i think it is a fact of the greatest interest that almost everything we have discovered about sound has found some application in the war 
all the discoveries made by lord rayleigh and other great investigators of the problems of sound the results of the work of men who worked for the enjoyment of discovery and for the love of the beautiful things they found for all these we have had reason to be grateful because they have been useful in time of need but those who made the discoveries had no idea of the uses to which they were to be put they could not have done their work if they had thought of it in that way it has always been so and must always be so when war came and urgent problems had to be solved the men who made the best use of the knowledge acquired in times of peace were those soldiers who were students of science or students of science who had become soldiers you cannot solve the problem at the front without knowledge of science and you cannot do the best work in the laboratory at home without first-hand knowledge of the problem that is why we urge that both army and navy must keep in touch with science that there should be a skeleton corps of scientific men engaged in the study of the scientific problems of war who would be a nucleus round which all the science of the country would gather in time of war ready to play their part at once there is just one point more in what i have been saying i have had in my mind more than the application to times of war it is the fact that in our lives in all that we work at and strive for it is of first importance to know as much as we can about what we are doing to learn from the experience of others and not stopping at that to find out more for ourselves so that our work may be the best of which we are capable that is what science stands for it is only half the battle i know there is also the great driving force which we know under the name of religion from religion comes a man's purpose from science his power to achieve it sometimes people ask if religion and science are not opposed to one another they are in the sense that the thumb and fingers of my hand are opposed to one another it is an opposition by means of which anything can be grasped it is right therefore with all our heart to learn what will help us in the work we want to do so that when the call comes we can say i am here and ready i want to play my part and i have tried to fit myself to play it well end of lecture six and end of the world of sound by sir william h bragg recording by ruth golding christmas two thousand and fifteen